Welcome to the Wiener Holocaust Library online commemoration for Holocaust Memorial Day 2021. This year, reflecting on the theme, Be the Light in the Darkness, carries an urgent sense of purpose. In the context of the coronavirus pandemic, the impossibility of physical togetherness this Holocaust Memorial Day and the sense of connection that that would bring will be painful. We have adapted, we have shown resilience, but hard work of rebuilding lies before us. Thinking about the theme of Holocaust Memorial Day recently, I've felt mixed emotions. At times I've been inspired and energized by the example of others. And other times I felt overwhelmed by what is happening in the wider world, a world seemingly engulfed by turmoil and crisis. Today, we have come together to remember, to honor the survivors and to listen to extraordinary eyewitness accounts. The accounts we will hear today were deposited decades ago in the archives of the Wiener Holocaust Library, the world's oldest and Britain's largest documentation center of the Holocaust and other genocides. We will hear readings from three testimonies today. Some of what we will hear is about survival. Some of what we will hear is about people who did not survive. This is important. We must not turn away from the hardest truths about the Holocaust or the hardest truths about the world in which the Holocaust happened. This was a world in which the murder of six million Jews was not prevented. A world in which other victims of Nazi persecution including Roma and Sinti, Soviet prisoners of war, disabled people and political opponents of the Nazi regime were confined in murderous camps. A world in which Jewish refugees were turned away from borders, including by Britain, returning to peril of death. Despite commitments that the catastrophe of the Holocaust should never be repeated, we know that genocides have been perpetrated since 1945 in Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda, and Darfur. We cannot turn a blind eye to mounting evidence that crimes of genocide are being committed today against the Uyghur people in Xinjiang, China. To paraphrase, to, to, sorry, to paraphrase Elie Wiesel, however powerful the oppressor, we must always take the side of the oppressed and speak out on their behalf. Many of you, like me, will have been awestruck this week at the dazzling talent of American Youth Poet Laureate Amanda Gorman. In her extraordinary poem, The Hill We Climb, Gorman said, there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Her inspired words at President Biden's inauguration have echoed around the world, encapsulating the spirit of our commemoration today and hundreds of others taking place this week and next. Today, we will be focusing on testimonies that are unique to the Wiener Holocaust Library's collections. These accounts were gathered in the late 1950s at a time when only a small minority of people were listening to survivors and refugees. The library, as so often in its long history, was at the forefront of this collecting effort. Over the course of almost a decade, the library gathered over a thousand eyewitness accounts of the Holocaust during the 1950s. We have recently translated the vast majority of these early accounts from German into English. This was a multi-year project supported by the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. And we're very grateful for their, for their support to create an extraordinary resource called Testifying to the Truth, Eyewitnesses to the Holocaust, which will go online on the 28th of January so that students, teachers and researchers around the world can freely access our unique and extraordinary materials. There are many things that make these accounts special, but one of them is their immediacy. As you will hear today, the experience of these eyewitnesses were committed to paper less than a decade after the liberation of the Nazi concentration camps. They have a stark and unadorned quality, condensing shocking facts and unimaginable suffering into a few simple lines of descriptive prose. Between the readings, we'll hear remarks and reflections from honored guests, 
Lord Pickles, Special Envoy for Post-Holocaust Issues and Co-Chair of the UK Holocaust Memorial Foundation. Sakir Starmer, Leader of Her Majesty's Opposition and MP for King's Cross and Holborn. And Rabbi Jeremy Gordon of New London Synagogue. We'll also be hearing a memorial prayer sung by Cantor Jacqueline Chernet. After a moment of silence after the memorial prayer, we'll end with some closing remarks from the chair of the Bina Holocaust Library, Anthony Landes. The eyewitness accounts from the Bina Holocaust Library collections will be read by actor Olivia Williams. Olivia. In 1958, Ludwig Gottlieb told the library the story of his brother Norbert's escape with another boy from the Nazi ghetto in Przemyśl as it was being liquidated and of their survival in the countryside. Norbert and his friend managed to cross the River Sun by boat and cover the 10 kilometers or so to a nearby village without incident. In that village lived a Christian farmer whom his friend had known before the war and whom he knew to be an upright person. When two young Jews suddenly turned up at his door that Sunday evening, he was frightened to death, but he declared that he was willing to help them. Together, they worked out that they should dig a pit under a potato pile on his field and hide there. The Russians were approaching, and it seemed likely that the war would be over in a few weeks, and then they would then be free. So they dug a hole under the potato pile and crawled in there. The farmer himself had little to eat. The Germans confiscated everything, but the farmer gave them some of his potatoes and on Sundays also a piece of bread and supplied them with candles and old newspapers so that they could follow for the first time what was going on in the world. However, contrary to their expectations, the war did not come to an end. Three or four weeks passed and the autumn rains began and filled the hole with water. For days and nights they lay in the water until the farmer got them some boards so that they could build a kind of shelter and protect themselves from the rain. The two young people in the hole in the ground, half starved and frozen, were in a terrible state and also on the verge of a nervous breakdown. My brother had taken photographs of our parents and siblings with him when he fled and they gave him great consolation. Their physical state also became more and more wretched. They were plagued by lice and other vermin and their bodies were covered with boils. The farmer provided for them as well as he could, but as the rations for one person now had to suffice for three, there were only just enough to keep them alive. It was not until July 1944 that the young people heard the Russian cannons close by. One day, someone shoveled away the potatoes over them, discovered the planks which formed the roof of their shelter and they were ordered in Russian to come out. The farmer was shot. We never knew his name, but the brothers were eventually reunited in London after the war. We'll now hear from Lord Eric Pickles, Special Envoy for Post-Holocaust Issues. Well, I thought that was uh, terribly moving and it illustrates more than anything that as the turning of the years, the number of people who experienced firsthand the Holocaust is diminishing. And we move from the Holocaust being within living memory into the history books. That places an enormous responsibility on our shoulders to be the light in the darkness, to ensure that the memories that we've just heard are are shared and understood because the Holocaust tells us more than anything what human beings are capable of doing in terms of sacrifice, as we've heard from the farmer, but in terms of straightforward deprivation as the Nazis and the, their collaborators illustrate. In being the light, we need to understand that the Holocaust itself did not occur in darkness. A lot of it occurred in plain sight and uh, in broad daylight. This was brought home to me um, a couple of years ago, 2018. I went on the March of the Living 
And I was lucky enough to be on the same coach as Ivor Pearl, somebody I'm sure many people uh, watching will be familiar with. Um, Ivor uh, went along with his, um, his daughter and his, and, and his granddaughter. I mean, he's a, quite a witty guy and um, he kind of teased me uh, unmercifully throughout the whole process and I rather enjoyed his company. And I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, the only time that I saw him looking vulnerable was when we eventually got to Auschwitz. Now I'm on the International uh, Commission for, for Auschwitz and I'm a, a frequent visitor there. And I've been on the, the, the separation ramp, again, I think people will be familiar with many times. But I think this was Ivor's second time the last time he was there was in, in 1944. And uh, I sort of, um, I went up to him and, uh, as, you know, with English, we tend to say stupid things on these occasions. I said, are you okay, Ivor? And he said, uh, look, Eric, it was a day like this and it was a beautiful spring day. He says, the last, when I was here, when I was separated, uh, from my family, uh, the the sun was out, it, the, the birds were singing, um, butterflies were fluttering down the lines of, of of separation. Don't let anybody tell you that the Holocaust just occurred in the darkness, in the snow. It it, it appeared in broad daylight. Now we know uh, from. Um, uh, various histories have been produced, I think particularly in broad daylight, uh, the book by, uh, by um, Father Dubois and uh, André uh, uh, Umatsky, that, that many of um, the slaughters that took place, the murders that took place, were organized almost as uh, an entertainment. They were scheduled. People went to, took their children, uh, uh, to see uh, Jewish people being murdered. That is a dreadful thing. But there's also murder by bureaucracy, by meticulous records. We've heard a little bit about um, uh, the Wiener Library being a copy holder of the Olsen archive, the old um, Red Cross archive. And literally, there are literally millions of documents carefully showing the, the destructions of the life of our fellow citizens by the Nazis and their collaborators. In a recent visit to the archive, we saw that even as paper became rare, that still the Nazis continued to record uh, on backs of cigarette papers, on, on, on pieces of tissue paper. And this is a, an enormous living monument uh, to the Holocaust. Wiener Library has played such an important part in ensuring that other copy holders can share their experience and searches from relatives, even now, 70, odd years after the end of the Second World War. The Wiener Library and the other copy holders are uniting people, uh, reuniting families, uh, putting people back into touch. They'll play an not important part in the new Holocaust Memorial to be built next to Parliament. What that purpose will be, will be to ensure that there is an understanding about Britain's reaction to the Holocaust, telling the things that we're very proud of and telling things that we are ashamed of. It will be part of ensuring that the memory of the countless millions that died, the Jews that were murdered, the Sinti, the Roma, gay people, transgender, uh, mentally ill people, disabled, murdered by the Nazis. And we will ensure that they are remembered with dignity and with respect and, and with humanity. For I firmly believe that remembrance in these times 
is one of the is our great strength. We'll now hear our second reading from the Vina Holocaust Library's eyewitness account. This account was written by a woman called Ida Stern, and she talks about how a group of children were hidden and escaped arrest. The convent of the Little Sisters of the Poor in Anderlecht was right in the heart of the Jewish quarter. Its activities were well known in the area. People came to the convent for nursing care, but the sisters as nurses also went to people's homes and looked after the sick and in need. Once the roundup started, Jewish parents took their children to place them literally in the arms of the mother superior of the convent. For sister Marie Aurelie was known in the district particularly for having taken in Spanish children who took refuge in Belgium during the civil war. I visited Sister Marie Aurelie on a regular basis to bring her money and ration coupons, information and requests, in short, for my work. One day in July 1943, I received a telephone call from the Abbe, whom I knew was in contact with the Mother Superior, asking me not to go to the convent. The German authorities were carrying out a raid there. At the time, the convent was sheltering 13 young Jewish girls between the ages of two and 19 who were being brought up by the nuns and attended local schools. None of the girls were at the convent when the Gestapo arrived. They were all at school. So what happened? Someone explained to Sister Marie Arely that the children would be well looked after where the Nazis intended to take them. They would apparently be placed in Jewish children's homes. The Gestapo would see to it and that there was nothing to fear. Why were people so afraid of the Gestapo's activities? By using her intelligence, charm and conviction, Sister Marie Arely managed to persuade the Gestapo to give her a little time to get the children ready for departure. The authorities were told not to come for them until the next day in the morning. The Gestapo agreed and went away, promising that the sister and her nuns would be put into prison if one single child disappeared before the next morning. A plan was drawn up. During the night, the 13 children were taken away. The next morning, the attention of the local people was drawn to a voice calling for help through a skylight in the convent. They rushed along and broke down the door. When the Gestapo arrived, the children had disappeared and the sisters were all locked in their cells making an enormous racket. They told the authorities a story about how the nuns had been maltreated by terrorists. They claimed two masked men, armed, one of them a redhead, had burst into the convent. The nuns had been locked in, tied up and gagged. The play acting was perfect. Sister Marie Arely was an outstanding actress. The SD went away without their victims and apparently unsuspecting. The 13 children were given hiding places by Dr. Hendricks. I continued to take money and ration coupons to Sister Marie Arely, who took on the task of ensuring they reached their destination as our group did not know from then on the location of the children's new shelter. We'll now hear from the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to start by thanking Toby, Anthony, and the rest of the team at the Wiener Library for asking me to speak today, and Lord Pickles, Rabbi Gordon, Olivia, and Cantor Jacqueline for participating in this service and, and for the very moving contributions that we've had already. The Wiener Library is a living memorial to the Holocaust in the heart of London, and I'm privileged to speak today as its local Member of Parliament. I wish we could be together in the library itself, amongst the books and documents, to feel the weight of all the history that is held there. The individual lives immortalized in millions of pages, like the stories that we've already heard this afternoon. The library's mission is to preserve history and teach us about the horrors of the past. Our role must be to take that knowledge, pass it on, tell people stories, and use what we've learned to tackle today's challenges. This year's theme of 
light the darkness is a challenge for all of us. First, to look for acts of bravery and humanity among the horrors of the Holocaust. That isn't easy when confronted with something so huge and barbaric. But individual stories, just like the ones we've heard today already, give us a way in. These accounts help us to remember those who compromised themselves to protect others and showed huge courage in standing up to evil. We're also challenged to look at what we can do ourselves to tackle hatred and discrimination. I'm very conscious of my responsibility in this as leader of the opposition and leader of the Labour Party, um, and as a member of parliament representing different communities in my constituency. I've received many emails from Jewish constituents telling me about their family's experience during the Holocaust and how this has shaped their lives on certain issues. Many of those accounts go on to express shock and disgust at the persecution of the Ouija Muslims in Xinjiang. Others call for a more compassionate welcome for child refugees and draw on the experiences of those who escaped the Nazis on the kinder transport. I will always keep fighting on those issues, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's what the lessons of history implore us to do. History is important, facts are important. During these unsettling times, it can feel sometimes like they're under attack. Institutions like this library give us the tools to challenge those who spread disinformation and bigotry, those who glorify atrocities or even deny that they happened. The courage to stand up to prejudice can come from supporting one another. Jews and many other victims of Nazi persecution, including disabled people, Roma, Sinti people, and the LGBT plus community should not be left to do this alone. They need vocal allies. We should also think about the other ways we can share our knowledge and be a light in the darkness. The Passover story of the four sons reminds us about the son who doesn't know how to ask. We, know, we must not underestimate the power of talking about the horrors of the Holocaust and subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur to those who may not know about them and don't know how to ask. To warn them where hatred, prejudice and bigotry can lead. Most, if not all of us here, will have had the opportunity to hear directly from survivors of the past. They may be our family, friends or neighbours. Learning from them is a privilege that future generations won't get. Instead, it will be up to us to protect institutions like this library, protect the truth and continue to recount these testimonies. Zikrona, Livraha, may their memories be a blessing. Thank you. We'll now hear from Rabbi Jeremy Gordon. Thank you. I'm very grateful for the sad honour and privilege of being able to share some thoughts today. I'm grateful to the leadership of the Venal Library and to Sakir and Lord Pickles and Counter Jacqueline and everybody for joining us on this occasion. As a Jew, as a British citizen and as a human being, when I start to think of the Holocaust, the emotions that rise up in me are anger and an all, almost overwhelming sadness. How could it be otherwise? How appalling is it that the deaths of the millions murdered and mutilated at the hands of the Nazis and their sympathizers has failed to wake up this human race to the sheer inhumanity of mistreating our fellows on the basis of religion or skin color or gender or how many ways can we find to behave quite so stupidly? But I think that there is something redemptive in forcing ourselves to re-encounter the tales of our greatest human failure. 
and I hope you will allow me to share with you the scraps of redemption that I find as I scrabble through the wreckage of the Holocaust. In her book, The Female Face of God in Auschwitz, theologian Dr. Melissa Raphael examines testimonies of what happened inside Auschwitz. She examines the testimonies of a Juliana Tedeschi, who was cast out as a punishment from the barrack block into the freezing night, wearing only a thin sleeveless shirt. In physical pain, her human dignity violated, writes Raphael. An overwhelming desperation took hold of her. But Tedeschi survives and records in her memoirs, in that moment, I had never felt such a strong feeling of being a grain of sand alone in the universe. But then she records that she felt two hands lay a garment around her shoulders. I recognized her, Tedeschi said, in the glow from the flame, a French woman, quite old, who worked in the shoe commando, had come to offer warmth and whisper words of comfort. Raphael gathers from this testimony, and so many like it, a survival of love, a survival of acts of kindness, of the recognition of humanity in the life of a fellow human being, and of godliness even, even then, and even there. In the reading that Olivia read so beautifully at the opening of this commemoration, that of the Jewish boys hidden by a Polish farmer in a pit under a potato pile, a record of courage and resilience, a refusal to give in, survives that time of darkness. That tale can inspire us today. It should inspire us today. It must inspire us. It is, of course, a testimony that make our current coronavirus-driven lockdowns pale in comparison. And in hearing it, I feel a little stronger myself a little more able to sustain my own humanity, come what may, and a little more emboldened to stand up to sustain the humanity of others. In listening to that second reading, the testimony of Ida Stern, the unfathomable courage shown by parents placing their own children in the arms of others, peeks out at us. A tiny pinprick in the blackness, but a source of light nonetheless. And that tiny glimmer can be set alongside the hope that radiates from the intelligence, the charm, the acting skills, and the downright heroic bravery of the sisters of the poor and the nuns who must have known the risks they were taking and took them anyway. So what could be my excuse for failing to stand up for the lives of others? What could be my excuse for failing up for failing to stand up to the, for the humanity in every human, ever. Human testimony always reveals humanity. Sometimes it will reveal our failings, but Holocaust testimony of the like we have heard today recalls also the survival of hope, even in the shadows of the deepest of, human, of inhumanities. That's why Holocaust testimony is so critical as we seek to dispel the shadows that threaten our own times, pitiful as they may be in comparison with the horrors of the Holocaust. That's why it's such a privilege to speak with you today in partnership with the Wiener Holocaust Library, an institution perhaps unique in this country in its commitment to safeguarding, archiving, preserving, and presenting for the academic and the general audience alike testimonies of humanity's successes amongst the record of our deepest failings. May we all be kept safe from the challenges of the horrors of the Holocaust and genocides that have come and help us, dear God, still seem to come. May we always continue to gather, to tend, and seek out testimony that can inspire us in times of darkness. For we all have the possibility of being inspired by this testimony. We all have the possibility of becoming a light in the darkness ourselves. We should shoulder that obligation 
with a sense of pride and a sense of honour. May we all strive to be such a light in the darkness. We will now move to the final part of this commemoration ceremony. First, we will hear the last reading from the Wiener Holocaust Library's testimonies. This will be followed by a memorial prayer by Cantor Jacqueline Chernet. After the memorial prayer, we will have a brief silence before closing remarks from the Library's Chair, Anthony Landers. This final reading was written by an anonymous eyewitness and an admirer of the resistance fighter, Marla Zimmerbaum. It has been nearly 12 years since Marla died at the hands of the Nazis. She came from Poland when she was very young and undertook her education in Antwerp. With her youthful strength, she helped her parents, a sick mother, a blind father, doing all she could to make them happy and lead a tolerable life up until Hitler's occupation of Belgium. In April 1942, during the first roundups, on a train from Brussels to Antwerp, she was arrested by the Germans and transferred to Malines camp, where on the first transport, she was deported to Auschwitz. Knowing many languages, she was chosen by the Germans to work in the concentration camp as a translator. Her mother was selected for the crematorium oven. From the beginning, she made the choice to help other prisoners. At each transport that arrived from Belgium, she was on hand to give here and there a little word of hope, of encouragement. She did all that was possible to save the lives of those chosen during selection by the Nazis and destined for the crematorium ovens. With an absolute conviction and full of hatred towards those slaughtering the innocent, she, with many others, made up the governance of the resistance in the somber concentration camp at Auschwitz. This hate that filled her also gave her noble intention to want to help the other prisoners, gave her the grand inspiration of an escape from this wretched camp. Preparations were carefully thought out and one day, accompanied by a young Pole, both, both of them dressed in German uniforms, she passed through the door in the barbed wire she in an inspector's uniform and he in a soldier's uniform. When the news of this escape came known to the camp, all the prisoners were filled with joy and hope because they knew that the aim of this escape was to tell the whole world everything that was happening in this camp. For two weeks, we were hopeful. Two weeks, we searched the eyes of the Nazis for a sign of the success of their escape but the Germans were without respite. Their searches were unfortunately successful and the news of the recapture of these kind young souls hit all the prisoners with a striking despair. With incredible bravery, she resisted the worst tortures. She stayed for six weeks in a dark cell, suffering brutal interrogation every day. She was condemned to be hung she stayed brave and proud up to the end, and before dying, she struck her jailer in the face with a superhuman force. With this gesture, she expressed all her contempt, all her disgust for this monstrous and inhumane regime. She died bravely, without breaking down, with the dignity of a heroine, and her name was carved into the memory of all who had known her. As with other heroes, her name will go down in history. Hey, <laughs> Ham zeim nu kan khona takhar kan fe hashkina bemalu kedoshim utahorim kezaraki yamazirim ed nishmot kol achenu bnei israel 
וכל בני אדם. אנשים, נשים וטף שנהרגו ושנטבחו ושנשרחו ושנחקו. בגן עדן תהי מנוחתם, אנא בעל הרחמים, אז תראהם בסתר כנפיך, לעולמים וצרוב יצרחיים את נשמותיהם. Adonai hu God who is filled with the greatest compassion Grant perfect peace in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the souls of all those people, men, women, children, who were gassed, burned, slaughtered in the unimaginable horror of the Nazi Holocaust. May the memory of those whose lives were taken so mercilessly endure, inspiring truth, dignity, and goodness in our lives. May their souls be bound up in the bond of life, and may they rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. Thank you. Um, it is my privilege to chair the Board of Trustees of the Wiener Holocaust Library. On behalf of the Board and everyone at the Library, I want to thank all of our eminent speakers this afternoon for their wonderful contributions and to thank everyone for joining today. As a son of a six-year-old refugee who escaped Vienna in September 1938 and someone brought up in the shadow of the Holocaust, it is vital that we take time to pause and reflect upon the dark times that the Holocaust represents so that we never forget and so that we can put the, those experiences and learnings and the library's vital collections to the service of the future. I feel honored to have had the opportunity to commemorate Holocaust Memorial Day with you all today and to reflect upon this year's theme of Be Light in the Darkness. Thank you all and stay well.